Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for November 30th, 2017. On today's show, we're going to have a Star Wars news extravaganza uh, with bits ranging from The Force Awakens to The Last Jedi to standalone films. And also in the news, director Robert Rodriguez and the Lord of the Rings television series. And in our feature presentation... We will ask ourselves, should the Frozen short film Olaf's Frozen Adventure have debuted before Pixar's Coco? This is Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's show is Slash Film senior writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Slash Film writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. Guys, let's de- dive into the news. We we got a lot of Star Wars stuff. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because you know the press is you know we're days away from uh, the Last Jedi coming out, and I'm not sure if people that are listening to this podcast know, but uh, when they did the junket for Force Awakens, it was done you know weeks before that movie came out, and the press weren't able to see the movie before they asked their questions. So I think this time around. While uh, they're doing press for the Last Jedi in in similar fashion, where we we are not shown anything, uh, we're able to ask questions about the Force Awakens that we never got answers to because we never got to ask about it in the first place, uh, <laughs> having it not seen the film at that point. Uh, so we're, we're we're getting some uh, questions answered there. Uh, let's start off with uh, well, a question we've always that everybody's been asking since Force Awakens, and that is. Who are Ray's parents? Um, we now have some information on uh, who actually decided the identity of Ray's parents. Chris, what do we know? Yeah, so in a new interview with Rolling Stone, uh, the last Jedi director, Ryan Johnson, says that no one gave him any instructions. He was able to come up with who's Ray, who Ray's parents were on his own. But interestingly enough, the the identities he arrived at were apparently the same exact identities that J.J. Abrams decided on when he made uh, The Force Awakens, which leads one to believe it's it's probably an obvious answer if both these people came up with the, the same answer separately. Although at the same time, you could also maybe assume that they're not telling the truth and maybe they're just you know saying that because it sounds like good PR. I don't know. But according to Johnson, that's what happened. That is interesting because, uh, you know, I, I still feel, you know, I don't have any concrete information on this, but I still feel if you watch Force Awakens and you see that scene between Rey and Han Solo outside of Maz's castle, it seems like there's, you know, some subtext there from a previous draft of, you know, Han knowing who Rey is. And obviously there's that scene at the end of Force Awakens where uh, Leia, you know, bypasses Chewbacca, you know, the, the, her friend of so many years and the co-pilot of, uh, her husband, Han Solo, and goes instead and hugs Ray, someone she's never met before. It, it seems, I don't know. I'm not, maybe this is conspiracy theory, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, that couple kind of knew who Ray is. And they, I'm not sure if that points to Ray being their daughter or Ray being Luke's daughter. But it, I don't know. It seems to me that there was some original plans there. Uh, ben, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I really don't. I, I feel like we've all run in circles so many times with <laughs> these theories and, and it's like, you know, one will get debunked, but then something will come up and we're like, ah, well, maybe this sort of ties back in with what we originally thought. So I'm I'm just glad that La- The Last Jedi is coming out uh, very soon and hopefully it will at least um, get rid of a few possibilities for us if it doesn't like outright tell us who Ray's parents are because they might end up saving that for the, the third movie in this trilogy. But uh, hopefully a few of those options will be taken off the table for us to argue about for the next few years uh, yeah. pretty soon. And we've been, we've been hearing a bunch of, you know, how Ray's original name was Kira, uh, which was, uh, you know, her character's name on set. And uh, obviously we had, the, you know, when they were filming that movie, Harrison Ford got injured, which delayed production, and they were able to reshoot some things and, you know, fix the relationship between Ray and Finn and uh, possibly even, uh, you know, remove the subplot that I, I am pretty sure you see in that final film the subtext of and that is not all that has changed with the force awakens apparently the ending of the movie was changed at the request of ryan johnson ben what do we know 
Yes. So um, Mark Hamill recently gave an interview and he said, his exact quote is, there was something that happened at the end of The Force Awakens when I'm standing on the cliff. I called Ryan in a panic because it was all wrong. He said, it's okay. I spoke to JJ and he's taking that scene out. It just didn't match up with what Ryan had written. So that's sort of curious. What could that have been? Um, we know that Abrams has t- has said a bunch of times before that he always sort of intended the script for uh, The Force Awakens to end the way that it did, essentially, with, with Rey presenting Luke his lightsaber because he called it, quote, one of the greatest gr- uh, drum rolls of all time. Like, he knew that that ending, w- you know, that was something that he'd, he and um, Lawrence Kazan were writing toward. So what could this I don't know. And, and it, I think it, Mark has said when he first read the script that he was surprised surprised when he got to the end of it that there was no line for him at all. Right, yeah. Um, so if there if there wasn't anything involving dialogue there, um he says it was something that happened and what could that have been? I don't really know. Uh, there's, it's, it's hard to even speculate about, but maybe, uh, some more information will come out of that yeah. in the coming weeks as, as all this, uh, press for the last Jedi. Can it, it, we, we didn't previously know that Ryan Johnson requested that JJ originally BB eight went with Ray uh, on the Millennium Falcon, uh, to Oct two and, uh, Ryan Johnson requested that BB eight, you know, stay behind because he needed BB eight to be with Poe for this Last Jedi adventure. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. What I'm betting it is, and I don't know anything, <laughs> what I'm betting it is is that originally Ray presented Luke with the lightsaber and Luke looked at it and then ignited it. Is what I'm, I'm betting happened. I don't know. It, 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 would, would that be... And I, I, I mean, maybe that's... Uh, I think when we see the trailers for The Last Jedi, they're hinting at a reluctance from Luke. Uh, not only reluctance to train Rey, but also a reluctance to be part of, you know, the Jedi. And I think... Right, so it could like, have been like an attitude shift, like something... That's why he said it's all wrong, was because uh, the Luke that appears in The Last Jedi would not have been excited to ignite the lightsaber. Is that what you mean? Th- that's what I think. Uh, I could be totally wrong. Someday we will find yeah, out. Yeah, that's a good guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, there was one more thing that that's sort of a, a separate uh, thing that's an interesting part about um, Luke Skywalker, and that is in that same Rolling Stone interview that Chris mentioned earlier, uh, Hamill and and Ryan Johnson were talking, and the Rolling Stone interviewer was there with them. And at one point in the interview, Johnson turned to Mark Hamill and said, uh, "Did I ever tell you that early on, when I was trying to figure out the story for this, talking about the Last Jedi, uh, I had a brief idea where I." where uh, I had a brief idea I was chasing where I was like, what if Luke is blind? What if he's like the blind samurai? But we didn't do it. You're welcome. It didn't stick. So <laughs> that's uh, that's an interesting thing. And I, I wonder if that would have been something that he would have had to speak with Abrams about to retroactively you know, change The Force Awakens in that way, too, because otherwise it would be really weird if there was like a, a Luke Skywalker standing there on Octu that had perfect vision and then the well, next movie picks we, up immediately after that and then he's blind all of a sudden. We don't know he has perfect vision. He kind of has this look of, uh, I don't know, it's a multifaceted look, but it's almost befuddlement, I, I think, a little bit. Like, I don't know, maybe he could have been blind there. I, I think he could have pulled it off just with that, you know, with that original ending. Hmm. Um, but uh, that's interesting. And also, um, I'm, I'm sure fans of Star Wars know that in Star Wars Rebels, uh, I'm not going to spoil that, but one of the characters is a kind of blind Jedi later in that series. And um, I'm assuming if they had gone in this direction with the Star Wars films, they probably wouldn't have gone that way in the animated series, even though that stuff is planned like a year in advance because animation is obviously super time intensive. Um, yeah, same thing with um, with Donnie Yen's Chirrut Mwe, who was blind in uh, Rogue One. This this uh, concept that Abr- or I'm sorry, that uh, Ryan Johnson was tossing around predated uh, the creation of Rogue One. So yeah, uh, when Force Awakens came out, I kind of I, I wrote this article, uh, which a lot of people like, some people mocked, and I think the the headline was, uh, "Who who awakened the Force in the Force Awakens." 
question mark. And it wasn't just my attempt to get Star Wars traffic and write another piece on Star Wars and peak Star Wars times. It really, like, after seeing that film, I'm not sure, how many times did you guys see Force Awakens in theaters? Uh, I think I saw it twice. How about you? I only, saw it, I only saw it once in theaters, but I've watched it yeah. multiple times on Blu-ray since then. Yeah. Uh, well, I was watching it. I'd watched it, like I think, three or four times at that point, and it occurred to me that uh, when the line comes that I have felt an awakening, um, it had not. It had come in at a point where Ray had not discovered her powers. It had come at a like a point in the film, and it. I have since realized, after writing this the story, that uh, the Snoke stuff in Force Awakens was edited around. It like was. Uh, shifted around a bit and that scene probably came after you know ray getting her powers and stuff um but anyways uh this is a long way to intro into the fact that uh adam driver was uh asked kind of about that title uh the force awakens and who it is referring to i think a lot of people assume it was referring to ray but he says kind of otherwise chris what do we know Right. So in this interview, Adam Driver says that the title is referring to not just Ray, but also his character, uh, Kylo Ren. Um, and he, he, he's talking about how in uh, the first Star Wars or A New Hope, we, when we see Darth Vader, he's already fully pretty much part of the dark side. Uh, whereas Kylo Ren, he's still struggling with it when we first meet him. And he says... We find Darth Vader already completely committed. I was curious about starting with someone who was less together, who was starting in a place of self-doubt. The title of The Force Awakens wasn't just referring to the light side, it was referring to the dark side as well. So there he is literally confirming that it's not just Rey, it's also his character and his, his still ongoing struggle, I guess you could call it, with his true nature. I mean that definitely makes sense. I don't. Uh, I don't think a lot of people probably thought about that while seeing the film, though. So I think that's an interesting bit. Um, also in the news, uh, some Star Wars standalone uh, news. Uh, Denny Villeneuve, uh, the director of Blade Runner twenty forty nine and Sicario and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Oh. What? Arrival. Arrival. Yes, uh, my f- favorite film of that year. Um, who, I mean, he, this guy is quickly becoming one of my favorite uh, film directors of our time, I think, um, where a lot of my favorite film directors of 10 years ago, I think, are kind of disappointing me today. But we'll, we'll get into that at a later point. Um, anyways, he was appearing on the Happy, Sad, Confused podcast and was asked the poss- about the possibility of directing a Star Wars standalone movie uh, after he had uh, – was kind of talking about his taste in blockbusters. Uh, he said, it's something that, again, it's like, I would be intrigued. I don't know. It's very difficult. What is dangerous with Star Wars right now is it's becoming its own vocabulary. I would love to see them. I think Rogue One was one very interesting attempt to get it out of that mold. I think it would be a great idea to get out of there and go on its on a new part of the galaxy. And I would be open to it two of that basically um so it it seems like uh you know he'd be open to stepping his foot into that galaxy far far away uh that to me is very exciting but again it's you know that that conflict we've been talking about this past week of you know you know when, when you have a guy like this who's such a great filmmaker stepping into star wars that means he's not creating an original interesting film of his own uh chris you're a big fan of denny what what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see him do a Star Wars movie, but at the same time, I kind of don't want him to become like the sci-fi guy. Like, I mean, he made Arrival, then he made Blade Runner, and he's doing Dune next. I kind of feel like he's gonna get like stuck in the sci-fi genre, and you know, there's nothing wrong with the sci-fi genre, but I'd love to see him take on other genres as well. I don't want him to just keep making sci-fi films for like the next fifteen years or whatever. And do you have any thoughts on this? Um, it sounded like I was listening to an interview with him recently, and he was talking about how uh, sci-fi is something that he was sort of working his way up to, like unintentionally. He'd want to, he had wanted to work in science fiction for a long time, and I'm sort of right there with Chris. I hope that he 
um, scratches that itch and then is able to continue to, uh, yeah, you know, just do more expansive stuff. And, and I, again, I love the science fiction movies that he's made so far, but I, I hope that it doesn't mean that that's all that he's going to be doing moving forward. For sure. It, it is interesting how Hollywood kind of, uh, you know, pigeonholes filmmakers into those kind of roles. I know a lot of filmmakers out there that are doing, you know, horror films or comedy or, or, or whatnot. And that's not necessarily what they want to do, but that is what, you know, they got the chance to do early on and they were successful at it. And, you know, all their meetings are about that. And it's interesting that, like, you have a filmmaker like, um, like Jordan Peele who has traditionally been involved with comedies and he had get out, which is, um, uh, I mean a horror film, but it, it is a comedy, even though it's, you know, it's getting nominated as a comedy for, I mean, it's in the, the comedy category at the golden globes, uh, considerations. Right. Um, but it seems like something like uh, someone like him, like peel is able to be given, uh, it seems like the projects that he's involved with now are totally out of that. Right. Like some people get that pass of like, Oh, we'll, we'll have general meetings with you to make anything. Do you know what I mean? We want to work. We want to be in the Jordan Peele business. And it seems like others like it kind of get pigeonholed. It's just a weird, uh, weird thing. I, I wonder if, if, if anybody is out there, uh, that knows the intricacies of Hollywood better than I do, uh, please email me at peter at slash and it, it, explain to me why that happens with some filmmakers and doesn't happen with others. Uh, I would be interested to, uh, to hear your thoughts. Um, but moving on. A director, uh, you know, I mentioned before, directors I used to be in love with have been disappointing me. Uh, one of the directors uh, early in my uh, love of film and independent film was Robert Rodriguez. Uh, you know, I, I kind of fell, fell in love with filmmaking. I wanted to make a, a film because of him. He made, he famously made it at, uh, what, a $7,000 film, which he, like, sold uh, his body kind of. For um, and it was, it was kind of like an inspiring tale that you can buy a book that he wrote uh, about that inspired many of independent filmmakers. Uh, he has since gone on to do a lot of uh, not so good films, uh, but in the news now, it looks like he might be returning to the low budget arena. Chris, what do we know? Right. So you mentioned that book, and that book was called Rebel Without a Crew, and that's also the name of a new. I guess it's like a game show. It's kind of like a project Greenlight, where he's taking a bunch of independent filmmakers he's giving them all seven thousand dollars to make their own movie in two weeks which is basically what he did with his first movie he made it you know for seven thousand dollars really quickly without really having a real crew and as part of the competition he's also entering it and making his own seven thousand dollar two-week movie um there's no details about you know what the movie is or how he's going to release it i mean i'm assuming he'll put it online or something like that but that's the gist of it yeah and this guy has a whole studio behind him now uh you know he has his own uh production company uh have either of you read his book the original book uh rebel without yes. a crew yeah mm -hmm. yep it, it is a great book that i would recommend toward to anybody i i, I don't i'm not sure if the lessons there uh, are relevant nowadays. I mean, I guess they probably are. Is like the thing I took away from it when I was a young filmmaker was to try to use the resources that you have. You know, to uh, you know, if you have access to X, Y, and Z, try to use those to make your film feel like a bigger budget film, and not try to you know if 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 you have an access to a hospital room. You know, make a movie in a hospital room uh, and not try to uh, write something that's outside of your budget range. Um, do you, ben, do you think that his his book is still relevant today? Yeah, I think so. I think the biggest thing that I picked up from it was um, the concept of having a vision uh, before you get out there and start shooting. Because a big part of the reason that he was able to make uh, El Mariachi for $7,000 was because he knew exactly what he wanted that movie to look like in his head. So he didn't have to shoot coverage, which for people who don't know, it's like, uh, you know, traditionally when you when you make a movie, you film a wide shot and then you do a close up and then you do the reverse angle or whatever. And Rodriguez in this book talks about how he saved so much money by not having to do those extra shots, because a lot of times 
the way that movies are made is it's found in the edit room. It's like, you know, you have all these different options to work with. And he's like, if I just know what my movie is, then I only shoot the necessary parts. And then you save so much time and money that way. So I think there's a, there's lessons in efficiency that are still relevant in the book, even if maybe the filmmaking world at large has changed a lot since the nineties when he wrote it um, or was, was uh, you know, cause a lot of it comes from like diaries that he uh, was keeping during the making of the movie. And also Peter, just to, <laughs> just to clarify, you said that he sold his body to make well, the no, movie. He, he, That's, he uh, went in he for medical experiments. Yeah. Something. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think he gave, he sold like plasma or something too. So he wasn't like participating in like, he wasn't like <laughs> selling sex for, for, uh, to make money for his movie. But yeah, just wanted to clarify that. It, it didn't even occur to me that it could have sounded like that, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and Robert, Robert, Robert Yes, used to do these. Um, I mean, Chris, you're a big fan of uh, uh, home video and DVDs and stuff. He used to do these uh, DVD bonus features that were like 10 minute film school or 20 minute film school on each one of his movies, where he would kind of like it. W- it was kind of like a video version of, of what his book does and sh- showing the efficiencies that he used to create that film. And it oftentimes, even when it was like a movie that I didn't love, it made me admire the work that went into it and how it was accomplished. Uh, Chris, do you have any experience with any of those short, those features on his his home videos? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, He's, he's one of those filmmakers whose films I don't really love, but I appreciate I guess his know-how about them. And he's like, he's someone who knows actually a lot about movies, even if I don't really like the movies he makes. He actually had this, I don't know if he still has it, but it was this show. I think it was called like director's cuts where he would sit down with directors like uh, Coppola and, and just talk about their whole career. And I, and it was really interesting and really informative stuff. So yeah, he's someone who knows a lot about the medium I just don't always I think I like like maybe like one or two of his movies, honestly, total. He's one of those guys that if you ever get a chance to see a movie screening with a Q and A with, go even if you don't like the movie, go go see it. He's I would put him in the same category as Eli Roth or maybe even Kevin Smith. It's like, you know, seeing their them talk is almost better than their films that they that they produce. Which is probably <laughs> not a uh, a great endorsement of of them but who knows we've been talking recently about the lord of the rings tv series which is going to be coming from amazon as it turns out hbo actually passed on the series before amazon uh nabbed it uh chris why 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 did that happen uh long story short the answer boils down to they didn't want it because they felt like they already had something with game of thrones uh, they also said they'd rather have their own IP than work with a product that is linked to, to someone else other than their brand, which is strange because Game of Thrones is ending soon. But I guess they also they're, they're planning spinoffs and all that stuff. But that's what it boils down to. They didn't really want Lord of the Rings because they already had Game of Thrones. The the, the the first of those reasons that it's linked to someone else's IP, are they talking about Peter Jackson's films? I guess, or I don't because know. Because Game of Thrones <laughs> is someone else's IP. They're right, adapting exactly, the book. Yeah. That is, I think, yeah, I, I think it, it probably has to do with the way that, because, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Lord of the Rings series, and Amazon paid $250 million just for the rights to make it. So that's $250 million that HBO doesn't have to spend. Um, and yeah, like they, they've already worked out their deals with George R. R. Martin and, and, you know, whatever publishers own the, the licensing fees and all that stuff for, for Game of Thrones. So I think that's probably what he's getting at there. Yeah, that, that probably is it. Uh, and now let's go to our feature presentation. Uh, earlier in the week, Ben wrote this article, uh, hot take, which wasn't so hot actually, I think. Um, no, I think it was it's, a joke. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is pretty much everybody who's seeing this movie, their their take on this. And that is that Olaf's Frozen Adventure should not have debuted before Coco. So, uh, Ben, wh- wh- why do you feel this way? So, Olaf's Frozen Adventure is a 21-minute long featurette about Olaf and, and his friends discovering the true meaning of the holidays. Well, it's not a featurette. Uh, it's like a short film, right? 
Well, technically, and yeah, the only reason I call it a featurette is because I interviewed the producer of Olaf's Frozen Adventure, and he corrected me. I referred to it as a short film, and he corrected me and said, no, technically it's called a featurette. Um, it's like a throwback to featurettes that used to be made in like the 50s and 60s or something. So I was like, okay, excuse me. It's not a short. It's a featurette. That's the technical term that they're using internally to refer to this thing as. But for all intents and purposes, it's a freaking short film. It's just a really long one. Um, but yes, the my hottest hot take, which is the coldest take possible, the lukewarm take uh, that everyone has, is that it was a really, really terrible idea for them to put this in front of Coco because everyone hates sitting through a 21 minute long short film before they get to watch the movie that they actually paid to see. Uh, you know, normal Pixar shorts are whatever, five minutes or something like that. And there's a huge difference between that and a 21 minute thing. You know, it's hard. I don't even have children and I know it's got to be in- insane for parents to have to, Uh, keep their kids wrangled and quiet and still for an extra 21 minutes on top of the running time of a full animated feature movie. And it's not even Um, just a full animated feature movie because a lot of animated feature movies are 90 minutes, 100 minutes. Coco is 110 minutes. So after your 15 minutes of trailers, you are sitting through this 22 minute feature or this featurette or whatever it's, it's a short film. Yeah, you're sitting we can, we can 20, call it a short. Yeah. yeah, you're sitting through this 22-minute uh, short film and then 110 minutes of a, a movie. Um, have you ever been – I feel like, okay, the group of us are seeing movies a lot in press screenings with uh, a lot of adults and not many kids. Have you ever gone to see a Pixar movie – or not ever, but have you recently gone to see a Pixar movie or di- like Disney animated film in a theater that is not press, like on a Saturday, like afternoon? Uh, no, I don't think I have. It it is miserable because <laughs> kids cannot uh, sit still. Um, you know, I, I would be if I was an adult and I was bringing a kid to you know an animated film that I thought was like a hundred minutes long, and Disney shoved you know a twenty-two minute short film before it, and you know kids' attentions don't even make it through that hundred-minute short film. Never mind, you know, adding a short before it. That's just like torture. It's torture. Yeah, and the craziest part is this was originally developed to be a a television short that was supposed to air on ABC. I think that's why it's 21 minutes, because 21, 22 minutes is the perfect length for a half-hour TV program when you add commercials into the mix. So uh, to me... Yeah, it, 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 was, I, it was supposed to be a holiday special, and from what I've heard, and you know, I think there's a quote from John Lasseter that he saw it, and he was like, this is too good to be a television special. we got to th- show it in the theater, but... Um, you know, of course, that's just publicity speak. From what right. I heard happened, Disney was worried that Coco was going to do well at the box office. It's, you know, an original film. It's, uh, you know, it not, I think, uh, general audiences don't really have a connection with Day of the Dead, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. So they were kind of worried about the box office prospects. And they were like, let's put a Frozen short in front of it that will, you know, and promote it. And maybe more people will go to the, see the film because of that. I think is yeah. I, I was speculating the same thing, and I hadn't even heard uh, any rumblings about that. So it's it doesn't surprise me because that seems like exactly what happened. It was like they didn't have enough faith that Coco would perform well enough, and then it seems to have just backfired in a huge way because I've not heard a single good thing about this Olaf uh, Frozen short because everyone is just like so put out by having to sit through it beforehand. So for me, I actually thought it was fine. I I didn't see it in front of Coco. I saw it on a press day where we went to the Disney lot specifically to watch the short and talk with the the filmmakers about it. So I was like, oh yeah, this is like a, you know, it's a it's a pretty safe piece of like holiday filmmaking that that is not uh, offensive to any religion or any anybody, you know, it's it's a pretty it's a, a kids oriented uh, holiday special. It's not really anything too crazy. I thought there were a couple funny jokes, a couple like decent moments in it, but I wasn't like angry about it. But I I can totally see why people hate it so much uh, being you know tacked on to the beginning of Coco. It it also makes me wonder, like you know, you know they they're working on Frozen two. The the kids who um, grew up and saw Frozen in the theaters, when did that come out? Five years ago? 
Yeah, 2013, I think. Uh, you know, they're grown up. They're in the phase that, you know, the the kids that were singing Let It Go nonstop now hate Frozen, right? I, I'm not sure if you have any <laughs> cousins or relatives younger. Like, they, they, they you know, it's, it's below them. It's a kitty. You know, it's that thing. I'm wondering, like, it, who was this short film for? And is anybody going to actually be excited to see Frozen 2? Because I feel like... You know, those kids have kind of grown up, and it's not like a Toy Story 3 thing where, like, the film is growing up with the people. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the characters, other than Olaf, who I, I still find uh, very, very hit or miss as a character. I, I like spending time with the characters in the Frozen universe. So I'm like, you know, if if Frozen 2 were to come out tomorrow, like, I would go see it. I'm I'm interested in it. Uh, I just think the this was a bit of a misfire with this whole thing. But, uh, Chris, you were tell, telling us earlier you had uh, an interesting uh, Actually, thought be, be, about... Actually, before oh, you get to ahead. Chris, I just want to say I have not seen this short film. Um, I screened Coco on the Disney lot uh, actually twice now. Uh, I've seen this film twice, and both times I screened it. Disney, uh, I think, was smart uh, when they were screening this for press to not screen Olaf's Frozen Adventure before the film. And uh, it it kind of is telling to me that they they knew something, you know, it was probably not the best venue for this. Uh, yeah. But um, I'm usually a fan of Pixar's animated shorts, and I was actually kind of disappointed to see that, you know, instead of a Pixar animated short, they had this Disney featurette or whatever in front of it. Uh, but Chris, what, what are your thoughts on uh, animated shorts before movies? All right, so... I don't want to keep having this reputation that I'm this negative person because I do like things. I swear there are many things I like, but one of the things I don't like is when I go to see a Disney or Pixar film and there's a short in front of it, no matter what the short is, even if the short turns out to be really, really good. I just, I don't care. I don't, I'm there for the feature film. That's it. It's, it's sort of the same thing when I go to a concert where I don't really care who the opening act is. Even if the opening act is really good, I'm there for the headliner. And I don't know, maybe that's just like a a really weird tick I have, but it just frustrates me when I go to a movie and I got to sit through someone else's movie, essentially. Like, that's not what I'm there for. I'm there for the feature presentation. I don't know. I I cannot relate to this one bit. Uh, the only time I could relate to this is if the short film is not good. I know a lot of people hated the lava, or you know. But when it when the short film is great, uh, I, and we should also mention that why these short films happen. They're not just there to, uh, you know, uh, fill some time. The short films are there because Pixar and Walt Disney Animation are oftentimes th- using them as. Uh, R&D for future films. So if like they have a future film that's going to be set under the water, they might have a short film, you know, set under the water so they can kind of figure out the technology that will be needed to create waves and stuff in a film, you know, a year or two before that feature film. Uh, so it's kind of used as R&D in that way. And it's also used to uh, develop talent. A lot of um, the uh, directors that you see that are doing these Pixar films, these Disney animated shorts, uh, the feature films came out of the Pixar short program. And that's kind of like a way for like animators to kind of move up. Um, but uh, Ben, do you have any thoughts on a Pixar and Disney animated shorts as a whole? Like, are you pro or, or nay short films uh, before movies? <laughs> So I I totally see where Chris is coming from. Actually, I, I don't want to like leave him out on an island here because I I sort of am <laughs> I'm in the same uh, like I understand that mindset. Um, I and I think that uh, especially when you have something like Olaf's Frozen Adventure in front of a movie, that's like the perfect example of why that mindset uh, makes a lot of sense. Is because you are there to see Coco. You don't give a shit about frozen or you know whatever this frozen thing um but for me i'm totally fine with sitting through uh you know pixar and and disney shorts if they're whatever what if if they're actually short if they're five minutes or something it's fine because of exactly what you said peter it's it's a way for these up-and-coming filmmakers to uh to sort of show their stuff and and to have an opportunity to 
um, to yeah show their stories to the world and and potentially move up and and make bigger and better things. So uh, if that's the sacrifice that I have to make, um, you know, sitting through a five minutes of a self-contained story before the movie that I'm there to see, then I'm I'm fine with that. Um, and yeah, I, I I man, I feel like the concert uh, metaphor. Um, or, oh, or I totally, example. I totally agree with the concert metaphor. That, yeah, that, like, like that one. I'm, I'm more on board for that one than I am for the uh, the short uh, allegory or whatever. But, yeah. I, I personally want, I want short films before live action films. I want, I want to go to, uh, you know, see Black Panther and have a uh, short animated or short uh, live action, you know, thing about the collector and Howard the Duck. Before that movie, do you know what I mean? Like, I want to have things that tease upcoming things, or like, you know, I know that they did the shorts for the home videos, and that's how they kind of like budgeted it so that they could uh, get the money. It was there to promote the home video release. I, I, I think it would be great if Marvel had, uh, you know, a short five ten minute live action short film before the Marvel movies, so or, here's or even Star Wars movies. Yeah, cool. here's something I'm wondering if if uh, Chris might find a little bit more palatable. What if they were to show these shorts in the lead up to the time before the movie is supposed to actually begin? Like instead, or I guess in addition to the commercials and all of the stuff that you like, the pre-show countdown kind of stuff. If they just dropped them in there, uh, Chris, would you be more open to that? Yeah, I mean that'd be fine. We're just you know put it online. What, like I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not saying I don't want their, them to ever make another short movie. I, you know I'm just saying don't don't take up. I'm I'm busy. I'm a busy guy. I got <laughs> I got stuff to do. Don't take up so much of my time. That's see, all I'm here. See, see Ben, to me that sounds like a disaster because in in that early time they have the the house lights on, everybody's talking. You know, if I want to see something great like Jerry, uh, what was it? Jer- Jerry's game. Yeah, I'm confusing oh, with um, yeah the going yeah, one with yeah. the old man and the chess, whatever, yes. or like any of those great old Pixar shorts. I I want quiet and I want to like enjoy it, and I feel like if, if it's shown during that period of time, it, it just just don't show it at all at that point. Yeah, it would definitely be chaotic, but you know, there maybe they could do that and then put it online or something so you could have a, a better. I, I don't know. I'm just just spitballing here, Peter. Ben, would you would you be against live action shorts in front of live action movies? Um, so that's another thing. It, it's the same concept of like, ah, oh God. But I, I guess if it's like in the same universe and if it's sort of, um, you know, teasing things, if if it's essentially the post credits uh, scenes from Marvel movies, but before and after the movies, then I guess just because. I want to know what's going on and I want to understand these connections and I would have to write all about them. So <laughs> uh, I, I guess so. I guess I would be okay with that. But uh, maybe trim a couple minutes off of the runtime of the movie to make up for it. I don't know. Okay. I think we said enough about this topic. You, you can read Ben's whole feature on slash com. I'll link it in the show notes. Uh, as all the stories we've talked about on today's podcast are linked in the show notes. Uh, you can, uh, you know, read all the stories on SlashFilm.com. You can subscribe to Slash Film Daily, published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, please go to iTunes. Give us a rating. Give us a review. If you have a question for the mailbox or mailbag, send it to peter at SlashFilm.com and leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention it on the air. And we will see you tomorrow.